reading is from the book of Philippians, NIV version, commencing at verse, uh, chapter 2, sorry, commencing at verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold them firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. As you can see, Pastor Andy isn't here with us this morning because he's at the youth camp. So for those of you that haven't met me, my name is Danny and I'm one of the pastors here at Warmbrook Community Church. And I want to start talking about Philippians 2, 12 to 18 today, joy and shining. I've known many people uh, in my life who have shone like stars for me, towards me, because of the way God has worked in them and worked through them. They've made a huge impact on me in my life and helped me to see glimpses of Jesus through their actions and through their love. One of these who influenced me over a period of about four or five years he is someone who prayed for me and for Susie to know the love of God, to understand what God has on offer for us. And that man's name is Martin. As well as praying for me, he took the opportunity to build a friendship with me and to invite me to a men's event at the church, at the Baptist church. That was 1986. I went to that men's event and I recall on the way home, I don't know why on the way home I said to him, that was great Martin, but I'm not going to give up drinking. Because, because at that stage I was a home brewer in that phase of my life. I used to brew beer and the empty bottles were stacked up in my carport on just on the other side of Martin's fence. So I was thinking he was inviting me to get me to get rid of those beer bottles. But actually that wasn't his plan at all. He tried to explain that that wasn't his goal, but I wasn't really listening. I think my ears were closed on that particular night. But he continued to befriend me and make friends with my wife and our children. And he took the risk 12 months later to invite me to another men's event. And on that night, Martin's prayers were answered. On that night... His devoted prayers and his friendship proved to me that God had opened, God opened my eyes on that evening. I can't remember what the talk was about. I just remember the people I was sitting with and how full of joy they were. Another couple I had the privilege of having shine over me or shine on me for many years is our first, was our, is our first life group leaders, small group leaders. What I always notice about these two is their positivity and their caring nature. I've never heard them speak negatively about anyone or anything. They're positive, continuously positive. So much so that it's contagious and their three children have captured that positivity and they are now shining like stars in the worlds that they live in. Two others I just want to briefly mention are people that have since passed and have, term have had terminal illnesses. One of these used his work experiences to begin a ministry in this church in the last 18 months of his life to help people that were isolated. The other person shone even in her death and she held on to the, the truth that Paul made earlier in Philippians where he said that to live is Christ and to die is gain. She never complained. She continued to express her love for Jesus right to her dying day. All of these people made a choice 
not to hide the lights that God had given them, but to use them to bring glory to his name. Now we're part way through a sermon series, as you can see on the screens, called Joy in All from the book of Philippians. And this morning, as I said at the beginning, we're talking about joy in shining. As we look at these, sorry, in chapter 2, 12, 12 to 18, Paul speaks about some characteristics that I believe Christians need to shine. As we look at these characteristics, I want you to be sure, especially men, that this isn't a to-do list. This isn't a list that we're meant to tick off. It's also not a list to make you feel guilty in any way. It's to help you uh, connect with God, to help you become greater in your shining, if you like, which you're doing already. It's an encouragement, this, this passage, to live the way that God directs us to, to live as his children in a world that seems like it's out of control. But I was reminded just the week, this week that God is in control. He knows the end of this story that we're living in. The first characteristic, characteristic is live with obedience. Philippians 2.12 Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Notice, just keep that verse up there, Paul begins with the word therefore, as he's just finished telling us that we need to have the same mindset as Christ, which Andy spoke about last Sunday, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Instead, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Hebrews 5, 7 to 9, I love this passage, explains that a little bit more, expands this for us. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. For you and I, obedience to God's call on our lives will mean our work, our labour, everything that we do will not be in vain. And it's worth noting that that passage in Hebrews tells us that Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. And through his obedience, he was made perfect. He learned obedience from what he suffered and through his obedience, he was made perfect. Now I'd like to pause at this, at this junction and just push the stop button because I know that many of the people in our church, many of you perhaps this morning, are going through a time of suffering. Whether it's physically, mentally or emotionally. And it's real. It's happening to you. And right now I'd like us to stop and pray for you. Lord Jesus, we pray for all those who are suffering in any way. And those from our church who are unable to be here because of their suffering, we ask you to heal them and to help each one of them to trust you. As they go through these problems, may they make them stronger as a result of their trust and their obedience to you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In another letter to the church in Corinth, Paul states, we are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Our struggles are often, more often, the things that we learn obedience from. The next characteristic that we're going to look at is live out our salvation. Philippians 2.12, let's reread that verse. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now before we dig down into that verse, we need to be reminded of a major gospel truth because if we just see that last line, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, we might misunderstand something. And that is we do not receive salvation by our works or by what we do. 
If that was the case, Jesus would not have gone to the cross for us. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 explains that. For it's by grace that you've been saved through faith. And it's not from yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. So just as obedience is learned through suffering, so living out our salvation will take effort on our part. Another word that helps me comprehend this whole topic of, of growing and becoming stronger from one degree of glory to another is sanctification. Sanctification is a process. Hebrews tells us that he, was made, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, in the book we're reading, he says that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He prays that, that he will carry it on to completion. So we're all a work in progress, aren't we? God has not finished with us. We're constantly becoming better through him, through the power of his spirit, and hopefully becoming better at shining to the world around us. As we live out or work out our salvation, as we strive towards the goal, it will take effort. As we let go of the old man or the old woman and take on the new man and the new woman, it takes effort on our part. So we're saved by the work of Christ on the cross and we're saved to do the work he has prepared for us. In Ephesians 2.10, Paul says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the next characteristic, characteristic is a tough word to get that around my... The next characteristic is living with God's strength. And this is my favourite characteristic because it means we're not the power. We receive our power and our source of energy and refreshing from God. Amen. Philippians 2, 12 to 13, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. So we live out that salvation that Jesus has provided for us, knowing that it takes effort on our part because we trust and hold in awe the God who saved us. I like the way the author of Hebrews speaks about this fear of God. Fear of God. The Israelites who followed Moses came to a mountain, it says, says it's Hebrews 12. They came to a mountain that was burning with fire, gloom and storm, and even Moses was terrified. But we have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. <clears throat> now Hebrews 12, excuse me, Closes by saying, so we worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The great thing about our God is that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He wants us to draw our strength from him. All of the people we read about in the Bible are, were assured of this and we see their example in their ups and downs. Men like Abraham and Joseph and Moses and Daniel were all men who trusted that God would give them strength and would help them overcome. In the Great Commission, Jesus tells his disciples and he tells us as we read it that surely I'll be with you to the very end of the age. It's a promise we need to hang on to. But more than that, we need to get involved in, as Brandon talked about this morning, with the uh, Enjoying God course coming up that Peter Mangano is putting on for us. We need to get involved in this relationship with our God. There's an endless supply of power to be tapped into. And I'm really annoyed at myself. I don't know about you, but personally, I get really annoyed at myself at, at how little I draw on that power. I can always tell if I'm having a bad day or feeling the pressure of the world around me that I haven't been tapping into God enough. I haven't been tapping in to the power of the Spirit in my life enough. But 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore we don't lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. This means you cannot judge a Christian by their physical appearance. Because in, outside they may look like they're wearing out. 
but inside they may be feeling like a 20-year-old, maybe a 30-year-old. Now, there's quite a lot of people in our church family that might look like they're wasting away, including me. But I know that inwardly, inwardly, many of these are being renewed daily. And I love that because I sense it from them and they encourage me in my role. We can learn from these older people in our church. Is that politically correct to say older? I think it is. We can learn from these older people in our church as they trust in God in spite of the health issues that they're going through. And many of them, you might not be aware, are going through some major, major health issues. But trusting in God. Sometimes not even trusting in their medical opinion because the medical opinion is making them sick. So they trust in God. And their prayers are being answered. And I'm so glad about that. There's a divine balance that takes place in the life of a Christian. Our task is to keep that balance in place each day of our lives. Sometimes we'll become unbalanced. And if you've been feeling a little unbalanced this week, remember God will work in you to bring that balance back. If you call on him, call out to him. Our human responsibility blends with God's divine resources and remember his resources are endless are boundless there is no end to what he can do in your life if we'd only apply his power instead of leaning on our own power then the divine balance will work we can only reflect we can only reflect God in the same way the moon reflects the sun We need to have the sun shining us. The moon needs the sun shining on it to reflect back to us in the evenings. Just like we can become deficient in vitamin D if we totally avoid the sun. So in our spiritual energy, we can become deficient if we totally avoid the relationship that God wants to have with us. Zechariah 4.6 is one of my favourite verses because it speaks about this energy that God provides. So he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. The spirit of God worked in and through Zerubbabel to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the people of Israel as they came back from being in exile. And that same spirit that worked in him wants to and can work in and through you. The next characteristic is one I'm not so keen on, is live without grumbling. We all tend to want to grumble sometimes, don't we? Philippians 2, 14 to 15, do everything without grumbling or arguing. I just emphasise the word everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God, without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Paul speaks about how we shouldn't grumble or argue. Now generally when he talks about grumbling and arguing, he's talking to people in a church, talking to people like you and I, where we never grumble and argue in our church, I know, do we? We just don't do that. But he's talking about other churches where people grumble and argue, and he's trying to encourage them not to do that. But here specifically, in this passage, He's talking about when we grumble and argue in front of people that are not Christians, in front of people that we work with or play sport with or go to school with. That's what he's specifically talking about here. If we're going to shine, we need to be aware of how we act around people that are non-believers. And we should be aware of that within the church too, but particularly when we're out in the community or out living our lives, people notice how we act. Many of the people in the church in Philippi would have been slaves. So not only is Paul speaking to those who work for or work with non-Christians, he's also speaking to those who are in slavery and owned by non-Christians. He understands the power of being a good witness with our faith and how that speaks volumes about what Christ means to us how, in how we live. In Ephesians 5, he ta- 6, sorry, he talks about slavery Slaves, obey your earthly masters. And you can apply this, if you're an employee here, 
if you are unlucky enough not to be a boss or unlucky enough not to have your own business. When you work for someone, you work for a wage, this applies to you too with those who employ you. Obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favour when their eye is on you but as slaves of Christ doing the will of God from your heart. Christians who mingle and work for and with non-Christians with reverence and with respect and who don't complain and argue will produce work that's not in vain. So Paul recommends to the church in Philippi and to our church today to live out these character traits. Live obediently. Live out your salvation. Live with God's strength. Tap into the resource that's available to you and live without grumbling. The desired outcome that Paul speaks of is joy, specifically joy in shining. Philippians 2, 15 to 16, then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. Now stars shine in clusters. They shine in constellations, don't they? When you look up and see the Milky Way, you don't look at one star, you look at millions of stars. So we all need to live out this, to live out our salvation, to work out our salvation. We all need to be this light that can shine together. Philippians 2, 17 to 18, the final two verses of this passage. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. In these last two verses, he speaks about the reward and the joy that he personally receives from hearing of these Christians in Philippi. But here's a question for you. Who do you boast on? Paul is boasting on the church at Philippi. He talks about them because they bring him joy. Who brings you joy? Who can you boast on? Like Paul, there is someone or maybe a few people who bring you that same joy that he experiences. Is there perhaps someone today, even this morning, that you can go up to and say, thank you for bringing joy into my life. Thank you for the encouragement that you bring me. You might even consider grabbing one of these contact cards. I know we're now, we're in a world of technology these days, aren't we? Uh, I just see Brandon coming in. In my office, there's paper everywhere because I'm from old school. I need to write things down. The trouble is there ends up being piles of paper all over the place. Brandon, our, our, our worship pastor, is a non, he saves millions of trees. <laughs> Everything's technology. But I still like writing contact cards. So perhaps you can think of, even while Andy's not here today, Perhaps you might write a contact card thanking Andy and Kim for coming to our church and for sacrificing many things to serve us in this place. Or perhaps you might write a card for your life group leader that I can pass on for you or someone else in a ministry in this church that I'll make sure I pass on for you, encouraging them, telling them that you want to boast in them, that they bring joy into your life. If you can't do that this morning, take a few home with you and bring them in next Sunday and drop them into the offering box. Or if you like, use the old-fashioned way and ring someone or text someone and say, I really appreciate you. You bring joy into my life. There'll be days, maybe even weeks, when you fail to know the joy that Paul is speaking of. When that happens, and it may be happening to you this week, This might have been a joyless week for you. If that happens, please recall the four things that we talked about today and come back to the source of strength. Come back to the source of power. Come back to the source of your salvation and call out to Jesus in humility and ask the Holy Spirit to give you a refreshing, to give you renewal, because he can and he will do that because he has the power. 
There's a great song that Charity Gale sings at the moment called Call Out of the Name. Pray the name of Jesus over your family. Pray the name of Jesus over your church. Pray the name of Jesus over your city because his name is the most powerful name in the universe. Call out to Jesus because he said in John 15 verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches and if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for being our source of strength. You are our, you are our source of power. Thank you that through you alone we can shine like stars in the sky as we hold on to the word of life. Holy Spirit, help us to look for you for refreshing and for renewal as we acknowledge that we can do nothing without you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.